Welcome to a blast from my past. I'm the guy in the middle wearing the black t-shirt with a little more hair than I have now and a few less pounds than I have now and a whole lot more energy back then than I have now. However, I, I'm not showing you this picture to, to talk about my musical escapades or my former bandmates, though if you, if you do want to have those conversations, um, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to sit down and talk to you about it. There's something else I, I'd, I'd like to talk with you about, and what I really want uh, us to turn our attention to is in this image, you should see a golden circle or oval appear right next to uh, the bottom of the image, right? Basically where my feet are. And I know you can't absolutely see what I'm talking about, but I'm drawing your attention to a piece of equipment. So let me give you a better image of this particular piece of equipment I want you to, uh, to notice. What you see in this picture is called a Korg AX3G. Now, I'm not here to endorse Korg products or uh, I'm not here to give them a plug or a special commercial, but I'm just letting you know this is what I used to run my rig through. And if you're a guitar aficionado, you're probably chuckling right now, but y'all, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm a saxophone player in guitar player's clothing. So um, in, in this, this particular piece of equipment was pretty important to me. It was pretty powerful for me. It opened up uh, all, all sorts of musical worlds for me to explore. A couple of things I want you to, to know about this piece of equipment is it had 57 studio quality effects. And in each of uh, the presets or the editable programs, you could layer up to six effects at a time to create incredible and awesome sounds. It also had 16 amp vintage and modern amp simulators so you could take different uh, amplifiers uh, throughout time and you could basically uh, rob their sounds because it was built into this little pedal. It also had 10 cabinets, speaker cabinets, all the way from little bitty uh, single speaker 8-inch cabinets all the way to 4 by 12 cabinets for bigger rock outfits that you could use to just create a, a wealth of, of, of sounds. And it had 40 built-in presets plus 40 empty slots where you could create your own tones and sounds and use amps and you get the picture. There was myriad opportunity of musical sounds you could use. It was a super abundance of musical goodness that was at my fingertips or under my feet depending upon which pedal I stepped on. Now I'm going to ask you this question. With this super abundance of musical options and sounds and all these sorts of things available to me, how many of these do you really think I used? I'm going to give you a second to, to think about that. How many do you think I actually used? I used four. Out of all the possibilities that I had, I only used four different sounds. A super abundance of options in this little piece of equipment was left unused and untapped. It's kind of ridiculous if, if you think about it. It's also kind of sad, really, at this point, because this, this pedal that I used to use with great regularity no longer works, and the guitar that I played um, with this particular band is sitting in a case, and it's absolutely silent and has been so for years. Now, if you're a musician, you can probably relate to me on some level. And, and if you're not, the fact is you can still relate to me because we all have stories of superabundance that were left untapped and unused. There's been times in all of our lives when a superabundance of something was made available to us or we had a particular gift that offered a superabundance to the world and we just kind of left it untapped. So as we worship together... I would like for us to make a covenant with one another this morning. I would like for us to, to make this pact together, if you will. When life and faith bless you with a superabundance, don't waste it. Embrace it, celebrate it, and share it. John chapter 2, where Jesus is at a wedding in Cana, is a story of superabundance. Hear these words from John's Gospel. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. 
When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, They don't have any wine. And Jesus replied, Woman, what does that have to do with me? My time hasn't come yet. His mother told the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby were six stone water jars used for the Jewish cleansing ritual, each able to hold about 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some from them and take it to the head waiter. And they did, and the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine. He didn't know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The head waiter called the groom and said, Everyone serves the good wine first. They bring out the second-rate wine only when the guests are drinking freely. You kept the good wine until now. This was the first miraculous sign that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. He revealed His glory, and His disciples believed in Him. This is the word of the Lord. So, here we have the story of superabundance, of Jesus turning water into wine, and it's one of the most well-known stories in all of Scripture. And in John's Gospel, this is the first public act that Jesus does, and it sets the tone for His entire ministry. So how does turning water into wine set the tone for Jesus' ministry? First, we have to, when we, when we go down that road, we have to look at the symbolism of wine itself. Now, living here in the South and in the Bible Belt, I, I totally get it. Wine and alcohol kind of has a bad rap in, in this part of the world. And for sure, abuse of alcohol is a bad thing, and I've seen it destroy families and lives. So if you have a problem with alcohol, I encourage you to, to seek help. If you are in the process of sobriety and you are continuing to go down that road, I encourage you to continue in your sober ways. And the church is behind you. We are your cheerleader. We love you and we are rooting for you. Now, with that being said, biblically speaking, the concept of wine, especially in the Old Testament, has a different sort of function. It has a celebratory function. It's a sign of God's blessing and of human flourishing. We see this in texts such as Psalm 104, 14 and 15, which says this, You cause the grass to grow for the cattle and plants for people to use, to bring forth food from the earth, and wine to gladden the human heart, oil to make the face shine, and bread to strengthen the human heart. Isaiah 25, 6 tells us this, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. This is a gift of God's abundance and of human flourishing. Literally a gift given to us when we are dwelling in the places where God has, has created for us to enjoy and to dwell with God. Also in the Old Testament, wine is a sign of God's new age to come and of God's blessing within that new age. We see this in texts such as Amos 9.13, which says, The time is surely coming, says the Lord, when the one who plows shall overtake the one who reaps, and the treader of grapes, the one who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. Joel 3.13 tells us, In that day the mountains shall drip sweet wine. The hills shall flow with milk, and all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water. A fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord. You see, in, in the Bible, wine is a powerful symbol for God's people. It evokes feelings and images of flourishing and the inbreaking of God's glorious reign of God's kingdom reigning on earth as it does in heaven, which is our great hope as followers of Jesus. See, this sets the tone for Jesus' ministry because in John's gospel, Jesus' presence in the world along with His death, resurrection, and ascension, John refers to this as His hour. Remember, Jesus looked at Mary and said, what does this have to do with me? My time has not yet come. My hour has not yet come come. 
So th this sets the tone for Jesus' ministry because in John's gospel, Jesus' presence and his hour, his death, resurrection, and ascension usher in God's glorious reign. So Jesus in human form offers all that wine represents metaphorically in the scriptures. Now, it also, the, the concept of wine, and this, this, this miraculous sign by Jesus in particular, sets the tone for Jesus' ministry in another way. Because it's a ministry, a miracle, a miraculous sign, if you will, of super abundance. Now, I'm going to share with you kind of a lengthy quote from scholar Gail O'Day, who did fantastic work on John's Gospel. And she really sets the table for us in understanding the whole theme of superabundance as it relates to this miracle. So here are what uh, Professor O'Day has to say. The miracle itself begins with a description of water jars. For the first time in this gospel, the fourth evangelist, John if you will, provides copious detail. The number of jars, their composition, their purpose, and their size. Stone jars were used in contrast to earthen jars because stone jars are free from the possibility of Levitical impurity. The best of the best is on display here. The rites of Jewish purification referred to probably is referring to the ritual cleansing of hands at meals. Even taking into account the possibility of a large gathering at the wedding, the quantity of the stone jars and their capacity is highly unusual. Everything about verse 6 of this text is overdrawn from the description of the jars to the amount of the narrative space the evangelist devotes to the description. The narrative technique mirrors the size of the jars in order to emphasize the extravagance of the miracle that is about to take place. You see, everything about the water to wine event is extravagant because everything about it is telling us that Jesus came not to just offer enough, but that Jesus came to offer a super abundance of God's grace. There is more than enough for everyone. Considering the water to wine of it, there is more than enough wine for all the wedding guests to enjoy. They all can bottle some up and take it home with them. They can all fill some cups and go out into the streets and share with everyone. There's so much in this miracle we're being told that we can all stand up and say, the drinks of grace are on the house because Jesus has already paid the tab. All you have to do is accept the gift and drink up and then offer a little bit to somebody else. What Jesus is doing through this miraculous sign is letting everyone know that in His ministry, it is a ministry of superabundant grace. And when life and faith bless you with a superabundance, don't waste it. Embrace it, celebrate it, and then share it. Have you ever seen a, a sign hanging in someone's house uh, or someone wearing a shirt that says this, just enough grace for today? Now, in all honesty, I get what it's saying. I don't, I don't have a problem uh, with, with wearing shirts of this type of thing. Every day has enough struggle of its own. And to be honest with you, if we make it through every day by God's grace with all of its ups and downs, its challenges and whatnot, I, I, I say we've done pretty good. However, just enough grace for today is not exactly the ministry that Jesus was offering to the world. It's not exactly what Jesus had in mind when Jesus left the heavenly dwelling, wrapped himself in flesh, walked among us, died for us, took up his life again, and then ascended to raise it, reign on high. It's not just about having enough. It is having a, an abundance a superabundance of grace available to all people and all creation. You see, Jesus' ministry is a ministry of superabundance. Through, through Jesus, we've been given access to a superabundance of God's life and world-changing grace. Are we living into that superabundance or are we just muddling through by embracing just enough grace for today? 
when life and faith bless you with a superabundance, don't waste it. Embrace it. Celebrate it and share it. Remember, that's our covenant moving forward today. Don't let the superabundance of God's grace end up like my old guitar pedal and guitar rig. It was full of opportunity and full of potential, but I left so much of it untapped and undone. I mean, how much beautiful music was left unwritten? How many beautiful songs were left unplayed? The same could be said for the same could be said for our lives. How much beauty are we missing because we don't embrace the superabundance of God's grace? We leave it untapped and untouched. How much beauty are we keeping from sharing with those around us in our immediate context because we don't embrace the superabundance of God's grace? We leave it untapped and untouched. How much potential and beauty are the people of God as a whole withholding from the world because we don't embrace the superabundance of God's grace? We leave so much untapped and untouched. Let's be people of not just enough grace for today. Let's be people of superabundant grace. That's what Jesus offers to each and every one of us. May we embrace it. May we celebrate it. And may we share it abundantly with others. Now, as we end our time together this morning, I know those of you worshiping online, uh, sometimes kind of responsive reading or saying things out loud in your living room kind of makes you feel strange or hokey, but I would like for us across cyberspace and even across time, because not everyone's watching this service at the same time, I would like for us to join together in saying the words that are about to appear on your screen so that we covenant together, uh, we have entered this time to worship, let us depart this time to serve and let us do so. Let's end this homiletical, this sermonic moment by joining our voices together with these words. Jesus offers a superabundance of grace. As Jesus' follower, I will embrace God's grace. I will celebrate God's grace. And I will freely share God's grace so that God's superabundant grace might be made even more abundant through me. And together, all of God's people said, Amen. Before we end our time together, I would like to let you know, maybe for the first time, or remind our Pleasant Hill family of our mission. The mission of Pleasant Hill is to connect with God, connect with people, and to connect people with God. To engage in those sorts of ministries in the world and to have those sorts of activities and to meet our community in the midst of its own needs, it requires financial contributions. Now, no one's here uh, begging or trying to guilt someone into giving. We don't give out of obligation. We give out of joyful hearts, right? God has poured out a superabundance on us. God has blessed us richly, and so we want to share that superabundance with others. So if you would like to give to the mission and ministry of Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church, you may do so at ph.church. Click on the giving tab, fill out a simple form, and that is a safe and easy way to give. Or you can also text the word GIVE to 256-801-2055. Thank you for your faithful and generous giving. The act of giving out of joyful hearts is a way that we embrace the superabundant grace of God and share it with the world. And I think that brings a smile to God's face. Now, let me offer a benediction to you, people of God. When life and faith bless you with a superabundance, don't waste it, embrace it, celebrate it, and share it. This week, identify an area of superabundance in your life, call it by name, thank God for it, then share it so that God is glorified and the world is made more grace-filled. And as you go into the world to love and serve God, go knowing that the love of God the grace of Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with each and every one of us. And together, 
God's people celebrate by saying, Amen. One additional announcement I would like to uh, offer to you today. Uh, because of inclement weather, we some of you may be um, uh, watching this with a little bit of snow and ice uh, going on, and so you weren't able to, to join us uh, in person today if those services, in fact, did take, did take place. Uh, but one thing I want to remind you of is next week on January the 23rd, we will have a unity service in the Family Life Center. Reverend Dr. Rick Owen will be joining us, uh, and that service will take place at 10 o'clock. So I invite you to be a part of that. And then at 1.30 that afternoon, we will have our first Connectional Council meeting. Uh, Rick will uh, offer a 20 to 30 minute uh, teaching on leadership. And then uh, we will thank him for his time and uh, we will bless him. And then we will continue with our meeting as our uh, committees begin discussing the things that they need to as we begin this, this new year. Everyone is invited to this meeting. Everyone that is a member uh, of Pleasant Hill will have voice at these meetings. And those around the table that are part of the Connectional Council will have voice and vote. So if there's something you would like to come and make your voice known, uh, that's the place to do it. So we hope to see you next week. And may God bless you.